We read the resurrection story this morning from Matthew chapter 28, starting at the first verse. Let us listen together for God's word to us today. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and, her, and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly, with fear and great joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, we pray that as we hear your word this morning, as we contemplate the events of that Easter long ago, that you would speak to us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Make your deed on that day a deed that is new to us on this day. We pray in your name. Amen. There have been a lot of earthquakes in the news recently. You've probably seen news coverage of them. Just this Friday near Acapulco, Mexico, there was one that registered a 7.2 on the Richter scale. At the beginning of April, in in northern Chile, 8.2. And recently back in March, in Los Angeles, 5.1. Every time these earthquakes strike, someone on the news is asking someone who knows what they're talking about whether this means a great big one is coming, and the, the, the scholar always says, no, it doesn't. I grew up in Southern California, a town called Ventura, about an hour or five outside of Los Angeles, depending on traffic. <laughs> and it was the early morning on Saturday, January 17, in 1994, and I had friends over. We were sleeping on the floor of our living room. And we woke up at 4.30. And the first thing that I remember was watching the picture frames on the wall shaking. And immediately my dad came running into the doorway and told us to take cover because there was an earthquake. And the whole house was shaking. We could hear the, the dishes rattling. And, and uh, we, we quickly went and stood under a doorway to try to find safe shelter. Now, for those of you who grew up anywhere but out west, you don't realize that growing up out west, you have earthquake drills all the time. You don't have tornado drills. You don't have hurricane drills. You have earthquake drills. And when an earthquake strikes, you do actually what you would do in any other emergency. At school, you climb under your desk. And at home, you go into a doorway. You stand under the frame of a door because it's, it's better supported. Should something cave in, you're safe there. Or so we think. (laughs) An earthquake is a fearsome event. Because the ground that we stand on is something that we take for granted. We take for granted the stability of the ground. And when an earthquake strikes, that very stability is gone. The very thing that we assume and count on all the time suddenly is gone. And there's no escape from an earthquake. You can't run from an earthquake. Because it's everywhere. And everything that we have constructed, everything that we as humans with our hands have built to shelter and protect ourselves becomes our greatest threat. I was looking up some information yesterday on earthquakes on the U.S. Geological Survey site, and they have an earthquake tip of the day. And the earthquake tip of the day was that the most dangerous thing during an earthquake is a building. I don't imagine they change that very often. That would seem to be pretty helpful advice for any earthquake on any day. Our story this morning begins with the very ground shaking. As the news of Easter is delivered, Matthew tells us that there was a great earthquake. Now this this telling of the story is unique to Matthew. 
The other Gospels don't describe an earthquake. In fact, they, they don't describe it anywhere near the, with the kind of drama that Matthew describes it with. In John's Gospel, John simply says that the stone had been removed. And in Mark's Gospel, the stone had been rolled back and there was a young man in white sitting in the tomb. Mark doesn't even call the man an angel. And then in Luke's telling, the stone was rolled away and there were two men in dazzling clothes. So we see them getting increasingly more interesting, but they don't even come close to Matthew who says this, Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him the guards shook and became like dead men. Now why does Matthew tell us this story with such drama? Why does Matthew do what none of the other Gospel writers do and add all this drama into the story? Is it, is it simply a, a demonstration of God's power? Is it a miraculous event to inspire awe and belief in those who watched? I think the ground shakes because reality is shifting on that morning. When Jesus rises from the tomb, reality as we know it is changing. After the earthquake, the Northridge earthquake as it came to be known, just past its 20th anniversary, but after that quake, uh, we walked through our house and we, we wanted to make sure that nothing had really been broken or damaged. And so we're, we're opening kitchen cupboards and the occasional cup or glass might fall out because everything had shifted. The pictures were all askew on the wall, so there was a lot of straightening up to do. Everything looked just a little bit off. And then we walked outside. Again, it's about 4.45 in the morning, and we look up, and we see a, a brilliant display of stars. Los Angeles is one of the most overcrowded, overpopulated places in our country. It's a place where you don't get to see a lot of stars, and there on that morning, we saw a beautiful display. Everything had changed so much after that earthquake. And so, after an earthquake, things are out of joint. Things are not quite where we expect them to be. Things are not exactly where we left them. And so Matthew, in telling us the story of an earthquake, is telling us that there has been a seismic shift. That things now are not what you expect them to be. Now one of the things that we know about ourselves in the 21st century is that we are an information-driven society. We are information-driven beings. We crave knowledge. We crave information. And it has never been more available to us. You've probably heard the old adage that if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. The Enlightenment, so 17, 1800s, the Enlightenment gave us the tool of reason. A brand new tool that had never been used in the way that it had been used in those 200 years. And we have inherited that tool. And for so long, we have only used that tool. The tool of reason. And so everything that we look at, we look at through the lens of reason. And everything then becomes a fact. Everything becomes data. Everything becomes information that enriches our knowledge of the natural world. Something that we acquire and possess that, that uh, enriches us, makes us smarter, makes us more informed. We treat Easter like information. We treat Easter like data. A bit of information, yes, very important information. Information that, that defines who we are as Christians, but often information. Just information. Jesus rose from the dead. The angel now did not say to the women who came to the tomb, the eschatologically oriented incarnational work of God has been completed through the atoning sacrifice of the one true paschal lamb affecting the transformation, salvation, sanctification, and justification of the human race. Although God's anointed expired due to asphyxiation, exsanguination, and exhaustion, He has been resuscitated and is now ambulatory. <laughs> the doctors in the room said, that makes perfect sense. Jesus, uh, the angel said this, I know you were looking for Jesus. He's not here. He has been raised. Go. Quickly. There's a difference between information and news. The 20th century author Walker Percy uses an analogy to explore this difference between information and news. He describes a, a, a conference. 
an academic conference where scholars have gathered from all around to hear uh, learned presentations on this subject or another, and they're all gathered together, and, and one presenter after another. And then someone comes to the podium and says this, there is a fire in the building. I know the way out. Follow me. Everyone in that room knows the difference between what everyone had said up until that point and what that person said. Everyone in that room knew the difference between information and news. When the women came to the tomb and they heard that message from the angel, they did not stand there and scratch their chins and say, hmm, that's interesting. They left the tomb quickly. And Matthew tells us, with fear and joy. But what makes this news so important? What makes this news earth shattering? What is it about this news that is shaking the very foundations of our reality? Why does it matter to anyone beyond Jesus' closest disciples, those who, who really mourned His death? Why does it matter? Why 2,000 years later are we still celebrating this news? Very early on in the history of the Christian church, some theologians formulated the idea of original sin. This idea that we are born because of Adam with a stain. We are born with a blemish. The blemish of sin which must be washed away. It's something that we are all born with. It, it makes us all equals. Later on in the Protestant Reformation, the Protestants sort of changed that idea. It was no longer this stain that we were born with. Instead, it was, it was the mark of human nature. Human nature is, is fundamentally flawed. It's fundamentally sinful. And none of us, even the best of us, with our best efforts, none of us can come close to God. None of us can come close to the holiness that God requires of us. They called that total depravity. We are completely and utterly depraved. Even the best of us. The idea of sin has become more complex over the last few centuries. With the industrial revolution and, and the, the rise of urban city centers and the ugly injustices that take place there has awakened Christians to the, the systemic nature of sin, the social nature of sin, the corporate nature of sin. That sin is no longer so simple as as my individual choices and whether I am making moral choices or not. Instead, now we are beginning to recognize and we see all too often the ways that, that sin has been systematized in our society across the world. That injustice is a part of our systems. And our best efforts to reform, to fix, to bring about justice, they are good but we recognize that they are not good enough. That nothing we can do will be good enough to create the just society that God desires, that God intends, the kingdom of God. And so as our understanding of sin has morphed throughout the centuries, one thing has always remained the same. And that is that we can do nothing. We can do nothing to erase the sin of the world and of our lives that we need to be saved. We need to be saved. 20th century poet W. H. Auden wrote uh, a long poem called The Christmas Oratorio. Uh, but his words are, are appropriate for Easter as well. In one place he writes this, We who must die demand a miracle. How could the eternal do a temporal act the infinite become a finite fact. Nothing can save us that is possible. We who must die demand a miracle. Nothing can save us that is possible. We who must die demand a miracle. Nothing that is of this world can save us from ourselves. Nothing that is merely possible can rescue us from the state that we're in, can rescue us from who we are, and what we do. Once upon a time, Robert Schuller, who was the, the founder of the Crystal Cathedral in Southern California, he was the host of the TV show, The Hour of Power. He was one of those early champions of the power of positive thinking back in the 70s and the 80s. And he was once interviewed by a, a BBC reporter. 
about Easter, and he told this reporter that his gospel is a gospel of hope, a gospel of possibility. You don't fail. It causes you to sail. And the reporter asked him this, if it's a gospel of possibility and sailing, not failing, isn't it true that your own Lord died a shameful death on the cross? How does that fit into the gospel of success? Schuller replied, oh, well, Jesus had some setbacks on Good Friday, but on Easter he put that all behind him. As if Good Friday were merely a bump in the road. As if Jesus' death on the cross were merely a minor setback. There can be no resurrection without death. There can be no Easter without Good Friday because Good Friday demonstrates that the best that we can do, the best that we can accomplish as humans, as people, as sinful people, the best that we can do is to destroy that which has the power to save. The most that we can accomplish in this life, and Good Friday proves it to us, is to destroy the one who came to rescue us. And Easter demonstrates that God is greater than our self-destruction. Easter demonstrates that God is greater than, than anything that we can accomplish as humans. Anything that we can do and try to undo, God is greater. Jesus allows Himself to be defeated by our sin to show that God is greater than our sin. So again, why is this news earth-shattering? Because the world has been altered. Matthew is giving us a very visual picture of a seismic shift that is happening. The world has glimpsed the limits of its power. The world has, has witnessed a much greater power than anything they ever imagined. The people imagined Jesus coming to wipe the Romans off the face of the earth. And instead, Jesus was defeated by the Romans. Pastor Tom Long writes this, Somewhere along the path to the cemetery, the women left one world and entered another. Without even knowing that they had crossed the border, they left the old world where hope is in constant danger and might makes right and peace has little chance and the rich get richer and the weak all eventually suffer under some Pontius Pilate or another and people hatch murderous plots and dead people stay dead. And they entered the startling and breathtaking world of resurrection and life. And our response is the same response as the women on that first Easter morning. It is fear and great joy. It is joy because death is no longer the end of the story. Despair no longer has power over hope. Darkness no longer shuts out the light. Evil has been proven far weaker than love. And these are a cause of great joy. But also it's fear. Our response is fear because with this news we are given a task. In the same way, when that, that person walks into the auditorium and announces that there is a fire and that he knows the way out, this kind of news requires an immediate response from us. It's an event that lays hold of us. It claims us. It grabs us. That is the difference between news and information. And so we go forth to go and tell. The angel tells the women, go quickly and tell. Go quickly and tell. And that is the same task that is given to us. The daunting task of telling the world that everything the world thinks about itself has been undermined. Everything the world thinks about itself has been turned upside down. That is the daunting task of witnessing to the Christian faith. That is the early message of the church. From the very beginning, their message was very simple. Christ is risen. The Messiah has risen. The One God sent to clean all this up. The One who had died, He's alive. He's alive. And everything is different now. The stable ground that we take for granted, the very ground that we walk on, has shifted under our feet. There is no escaping this seismic shift. There is no escaping the ways that the world is now different. And the greatest dangers that we face, the greatest dangers that we face as Christians are all of the structures that we have constructed to protect ourselves. Everything that we have built to save ourselves, to rescue ourselves, these now 
Now that the world has shaken, now that everything's different, these are our greatest threat. Nothing can save us that is possible. We who must die, and we must die. We who must die demand a miracle. God has done the impossible, and we are saved. Hallelujah. Amen.